1955 and Batman looks like this. But 15 years later, Batman would look like this. This change may look like an improvement, but both versions almost killed Batman. To understand exactly how this happened, we have to take a look at the most complicated time in Batman's history. We have to take a look at the downfall of Batman in the Silver Age of Comics. The Golden Age of Comics ended in the early 1950s, when the popularity of superheroes declined and DC Comics reduced their line of superhero comics to only three major characters – Superman, Wonder Woman and Batman. The comic book industry started looking at other genres, such as science fiction, romance and western, but the most popular and pervasive genre at the time was horror, leading to the infamous witch hunt of the early 1950s, when pseudo-psychologist Frederick Wertham published his book called Seduction of the Innocent, and convinced people that there was something wrong with every comic book in America. To the general public, the Batman comics of the early 1950s were superhero adventures made for kids, but for Mr. Wortham, Batman's relationship with Robin implied something more adult, more twisted and sinister. In 1954, the entire comic book industry fell under such asinine accusations, and unfortunately the general public and the authorities fell for it, resulting in the creation of the Comics Code Authority, a self-censoring entity with a large number of rules that any respectable publisher had to follow if they wanted to stay in business. As a result, DC started making the first big changes to the Batman comics, officially marking the end of Batman's Golden Age. The comics code had very strict rules against the stories about crime and since Batman was primarily a crime fighter, the whole concept of the character had to be changed starting in 1954, when Batman became DC's shining example of virtue, niceness and good American citizenship. Batman and Robin became public figures admired by Gotham City, and their role as law-abiding authority figures was quickly reinforced. The comics code also restricted the stories featuring popular criminals, which is why the classic Batman villains of the Golden Age, such as the Joker and the Penguin, became much less prominent, while Two-Face disappeared altogether. DC Comics also stopped creating stories with Catwoman, because the code ruled out stories about romantic relationships between the good guys and the bad guys. Unable to create proper crime fighting stories for Batman, DC Comics looked to the other popular genres of comics at the time, namely science fiction and fantasy. The Batman comics started featuring stories about robots and evil masterminds with giant heads. Batman would switch ages with Robin thanks to science, he would raise old-fashioned Batmobiles, and he would team up with new characters like Batboy, who is a literal Batboy. Though these harmless and less violent stories were not quite working for Batman, Superman became DC's best-selling superhero comic thanks to the family-friendly and science fiction adventures, and it's at this point that DC Comics became convinced that the only way to find success with Batman was to adapt all the things that worked for Superman into the Batman comics. Since Superman had seen success with his pet companion Crypto, DC introduced Ace the Bathound. Ace was a remarkably smart German Shepherd who assisted Batman and Robin by finding clues to solve cases, wearing his own bat mask to hide his doggo identity, and being a good boy all around. Naturally, the presence of a dog in the Batman stories made them a lot brighter, and after Ace's introduction, the Batman comics started to lose what little edge they had left. The influence of Superman was undeniable, and the reason Batman remained popular during this time were his frequent collaborations with the Man of Steel in the world's finest comics, where they shared a large number of adventures and over-the-top stories. One year after the comics code was created, the Batman comics started featuring strange stories about bat trains and bat tanks, stories where Commissioner Gordon dresses up as Batman, or Batman wears a tuxedo to testify in court, and even stories featuring Batman's own memorial monument. Stories that featured Batman's past, his training with the super detective Harvey Harris, establishing that Bruce Wayne was in fact the first Robin, his first sidekick being a random kid known as Batman Jr., and the introduction of the new Mad Hatter as this intense hat collector. Though these stories are unthinkable in modern times, they are the reason Batman remained popular among little kids in the 1950s, who were his target audience. 
However, not everyone at DC Comics was on board with this new approach. Bill Finger, the writer who basically created Batman in 1939, was still writing most of these kid-friendly Batman stories in 1956, but every now and then he would come up with serious stories, like The First Batman, a story that reveals that the death of the Waynes was orchestrated by a notorious criminal. In the story, Thomas Wayne wears a Batman costume when Bruce was only a kid, the same costume that Batman wears years later to capture the criminal responsible. Bill Finger took a big risk by taking a look at Batman's tragic past and showing the true face of Gotham's criminals once again. But unfortunately, these kind of stories were scarce, because DC Comics pressured the Batman writers to make Batman more like Superman, to try to emulate the success of the Man of Steel. DC Comics was determined to get Batman his own Lois Lane, and since Vicky Vale had failed to become a popular character in the Golden Age, they created Batwoman in 1956. Kathy Kane was introduced as a wealthy socialite who becomes Batwoman following the heroic footsteps of Batman. Batwoman was created primarily because DC wanted to dispel any doubts about Batman's sexuality, and the Batwoman stories consisted mostly of romantic innuendos with Batman. Similarly, DC started making stories where Robin would be romantically involved with random girls, with the only purpose of erasing the stigma of homosexuality that was cast upon them a few years earlier. The irony of it all is that only a few months later, Batman would debut their rainbow batsuit. This infamous story came about in a crazy plot where Batman wants to draw attention away from Robin to prevent the public from learning his secret identity, and the only plan that he came up with was to wear multiple colored batsuits until he finally wears the rainbow batsuit. While Batman struggled to keep a straight face in these changing times, Superman enjoyed a tremendous success in his own comics and in world's finest comics, helping Batman to stay relevant. In fact, the great success of Superman convinced DC Comics to try bringing back some of their old Golden Age superheroes, and in 1956, an updated version of The Flash returned to the comics. The successful return of The Flash marks the official start of the Silver Age of comics, when a new burst of creativity reinvigorated the superhero genre. Unfortunately, this wave of creativity did not touch Batman just yet, as the dynamic duo remained stuck in this weird era of increasingly absurd stories. 1957 marks a complete departure from the past, with not a single serious Batman story. Instead, DC published stories about a giant Batman, Batman's collection of batarangs, Batman's first meeting with Fat Man, Commissioner Gordon becoming a superhero called Mystery Man, the terrible trio, and the story about an ape dressed as Batman, also known as Bat Ape. There were very few interesting stories, such as the first team-up between Joker and Lex Luthor, the introduction of the evil scientist Professor Milo, and the stories where Batman and Batwoman get superpowers, because DC was still trying to replicate the success of Superman. Batman gained superpowers in the story called The Batman of Planet X, where Batman is taken to the planet of Zurenar by a scientist called Talano, who became the Batman of Zurenar inspired by the Batman of Earth. On this planet, Batman gains superpowers and he helps Talano overthrow the evil robot but invaders before going back to Earth. This story marks a turning point for Batman, with space, aliens, and time-traveling adventures becoming the primary focus of the Batman stories, marking the beginning of the most outlandish and crazy era for the Batman comics. The following year, in 1958, Batman gets superpowers once again in order to fight Superman. He also creates this strange one-man helicopter vehicle called the Weirdly Bat, and this year also saw the first appearances of Calendar Man and Mr. Zero, both of them outlandish costume criminals with oddly specific gimmicks and no real character. One year later, in 1959, DC Comics was still determined to translate the success of the Superman comics over to Batman, and they created the interdimensional magical imp called Batmite, as the counterpart of the Superman character called Mr. McSyesbitlick. Batmite quickly became the most obnoxious character in the Batman universe, and although he made only a handful of appearances, his introduction to the Batman comics marked the first real sign of a decline in Batman's popularity among readers. In the Golden Age, Batman had been one of the top comics for DC, but now he was surpassed not only by Superman and Wonder Woman, but also by the new and fresh versions of The Flash and Green Lantern, as well as Aquaman and Martian Manhunter. With this new roster of heroes, DC Comics created the Justice League of America, a modern version of the Justice Society from the Golden Age. 
the Justice League first appeared in issue number 28 of The Brave and the Bold, and Batman was part of the team, although his presence was very limited. Batman was not even featured in the cover of the League's first appearance, and although it seemed like the League just wanted nothing to do with someone who dressed up as a zebra, the truth is that Batman and Superman's limited appearances in the early Justice League stories was the result of editorial conflicts between the Batman, Superman and Justice League departments. They eventually reached an agreement, where Batman and Superman would be part of the team only for their star power and to boost the popularity of the new team. The plan worked well, and Justice League became one of the most popular comics, but with little appearances from Batman and Superman. While the rest of DC superheroes felt fresh, new and exciting, Batman felt like a relic from a bygone era. The stories had become stuck in this endless parade of aliens, monsters, robots, bizarre creatures, time travel and all sorts of outlandish situations. The people in charge of Batman tried to follow the popular trends at the time, but it clearly wasn't working. Still, they were determined to make Batman work just by copying the things that worked for Superman, and since Supergirl had been a massive hit with readers since her introduction in 1959, the Batman comics introduced Batgirl as the romantic interest for Robin in 1961. At this point, Batman was no longer a vigilante, much less a crime fighter. Batman had become a family man, quite like Superman. Both of them had an extended family of characters, and the Silver Age became forever synonymous with this version of Batman. Though most of the original Batman ideas were gone, Bill Finger remained as the main Batman writer, and in the early 1960s he created new enemies, like the second version of Clayface and the Polka Dot Man, as well as a few other villains that were used only once or twice, before being completely forgotten about. Finally, in 1962, and most likely feeling the burnout of grinding Batman for more than 20 years, Bill Finger wrote what is perhaps the most infamous Silver Age Batman story. Batman becomes Batbaby, a story where Batman becomes a toddler. You know it's bad when even the man who created Batman starts writing these things. DC Comics had completely lost sight of what made a good Batman story. The majority of them consisted of space adventures with aliens, monsters, creatures, imaginary tales from the future, time-traveling adventures as well as bizarre and outlandish transformations. Though these stories were not necessarily bad, the sales figures of the Batman comics reflected a different reality. Batman was in serious trouble. The comic book industry had grown, it had evolved. The superhero comic had been brought back down to earth thanks to Marvel Comics and their relatable superheroes. Marvel Comics presented the first real challenge for DC Comics, and although DC still dominated the market thanks to Superman and the Justice League, they were very concerned about the low-performing sales of Batman. Eventually, things reached a boiling point in 1964, when DC published a story called The Batman Creature, where Batman is turned into a monster. At this point, DC Comics had to face the fact that nobody wanted to read these stories. The popularity of the space race and science fiction movies of the late 50s and early 60s had convinced them that putting Batman into these scenarios would capture the attention of the young readers, but in 1964 they finally had to admit that they were wrong. Batman had been one of the best-selling DC characters in the 1940s and early 1950s, but by 1964 the sales of the Batman comics were so low that, for the first time in history, Batman was at risk of being cancelled. The Justice League of America was the most successful new title created by DC in the Silver Age, thanks in large part to the modern versions of The Flash and Green Lantern. These two heroes as well as the Justice League were all ideas created by Julius Schwartz, a veteran comic book editor who gained a reputation for successfully re-energizing old concepts, and when the time came to update the Batman comics in 1964, there was never a second option. DC Comics assigned Julius Schwartz as the new Batman editor, and he was given six months to fix the sales of Batman, or it would be cancelled. Julius Schwartz was reluctant to take over the job, because he was not interested in Batman. Nevertheless, he was a professional editor, and he did what he considered best to improve Batman. Julius Schwartz understood that comics are primarily a visual medium, and the most urgent change for Batman was to modernize the old-fashioned looks of the character. For this task, he assigned his go-to artist, Carmine Infantino, with redesigning Batman, telling him to include a yellow oval in Batman's chest as a visual reference to the start of his editorial run. A similar yellow oval was already seen in the Batman of Zoran R, but the new character design of Batman by Carmine Infantino was the most radical change that Batman had ever experienced. 
Schwartz also considered that Batman's appeal was not in science fiction and fantasy, but rather in the more grounded stories, with him working primarily as a crime fighter and a detective, equipped with the best technology and assisted only by Robin, who became a teenager instead of a little boy. This realistic approach to Batman was very much inspired by the popular James Bond movies of the 1960s, and to complete the transformation, Julius Schwartz got rid of the Batman family, removing Batgirl, Batwoman, Batmite, and Ace the Bathound, as well as the fantasy and science fiction stories. This new version of Batman debuted in Detective Comics number 327, in the most sudden and unexpected change. Just in the previous issue, Batman had another one of his countless space adventures, and now, without any sort of announcement, Batman had come back to Earth. DC Comics promoted this change as the new look Batman, and Julius Schwartz hired writers John Broom and Garner Fox to write the new Batman stories, with artists Carmen Infantino and Joe Giella doing the art. Schwartz kept writer Bill Finger for the first couple of issues, out of respect for the man's career, but Schwartz was also forced to keep working with Bob Kane's studio, as his contract allowed him at least 30 pages of Batman every month. Carmine Infantino would illustrate the Batman stories in Detective Comics, while Bob Kane would handle the art in Batman, with many of his ghost artists doing a poor job of trying to follow the new visual style. The new look Batman was an instant success, and readers of all ages flocked to get their hands on Detective Comics number 320. This historical issue features Batman and Robin doing actual detective work and fighting real crime for the first time in years. Schwartz and his team were careful about not breaking the rules of the comics code authority. This realistic take created a sense of identity that was missing from the Batman comics, and readers loved it. But there was one glaring mistake, where at the end of the story Batman holds a criminal at gunpoint. As much as Schwartz and his creative teams improved the concept of Batman, they were still not very familiar with the Batman mythos, which resulted in some of the most baffling changes in the history of the character. One of them happened in the following issue, where the trusted butler Alfred sacrifices himself to save Batman and Robin from a massive falling boulder. Julius Schwartz considered that killing Alfred would solve the problem of having three single men living together in Wayne Manor, and it also allowed them to introduce Dick Grayson's Aunt Harriet as a new female supporting character. In Alfred's memory, Bruce started the Alfred Foundation, an element that reinforced Batman's secret identity as a millionaire industrialist. These realistic changes continued for the best part of 1964 and 1965, including a secret elevator that connected Wayne Manor and the Batcave, a new Batmobile designed as a modern convertible sports car, and a secret phone called the Hotline, which connected Commissioner Gordon's office to the Batcave, officially replacing the Bat Signal. Schwartz succeeded in revitalizing Batman and saved the comics from cancellation. The new series' stories about mysteries in ancient castles, deathly death traps, and conspiracies by enemy spies were incredibly popular, and although the fantastic and science fiction adventures still remained, they were mostly limited to the world's finest comics. In the main Batman comics, Schwartz and his team decided to introduce a new romantic interest called Patricia Powell, a beautiful young police officer who had a crush on Bruce Wayne and who worked together with Batman. However, Schwartz quickly realized that romance didn't have a place in the Batman comics, and instead he became more interested in creating new enemies. In the fall of 1964, they created The Outsider, presented only as a mysterious voice that wants to destroy Batman. This was the start of the saga of The Outsider, which lasted for almost two years in which this mysterious enemy would constantly lurk in the background of almost every story, but never revealing himself until the end of the saga. This is partly the reason why the storyline has never been collected, because most of the chapters of this saga feature Batman and Robin confronting strange enemies or escaping complex death traps, only to find out that the outsider was behind everything at the end of each chapter. Schwartz wanted to extend the saga of the outsider as much as he could, without revealing his identity, and to prevent readers from getting tired of the constant presence of the outsider, Schwartz brought back some of the classic Batman villains in 1965. The Joker and the Penguin became the first of the classic Batman villains to return, followed closely by the Riddler, 15 years after his last appearance. The return of the classic Batman villains was hugely successful, to the point where these comics caught the attention of TV producer William Dozier, who was looking to create a superhero adaptation for television. Batman number 171 featured the Riddler's return, and it was the comic that convinced Dozier to start a Batman series and only one year later, in 1966, the Batman TV 
show was released and became a worldwide sensation. The Batman TV show embraced the colorful nature of the comics, adapting many of the iconic elements of Batman's new look and turning them into pop entertainment, where the stories were seriously played for laughs. Yet the show was never a comedy. This camp approach was never seen before, and it created a fever of Batman popularity across the nation, where adults enjoyed the over-the-top absurdity of the series, while kids enjoyed the colorful and imaginative situations of each episode. The Riddler, Joker and Penguin became the main villains of the show, as they were the most prominent enemies in the current comics, but the series also adapted some of the most obscure Batman villains of the 1950s, including the Mad Hatter and Mr. Zero, who was reinvented for the series as Mr. Freeze. The show also brought back a new version of Catwoman, and the first season established a formula of two-part episodes, in which any given villain would start a crime, the police then called Batman, who would investigate until he was captured and placed in a deadly death trap. The episode would end in a cliffhanger, and the story would conclude in the second part, usually with a bombastic fight that featured surf rock background music and grid and sound effects that covered the entire screen, which were actually included to hide the poor choreography and low production values of the fights. The series was such a massive success that even before the first season ended, the network renewed the contract for a second season and also a feature film to fill the gap between the first and second seasons. The Batmania created by the show resulted in the greatest sales spike that the Batman comics had ever experienced, becoming the best-selling comic book with more than a million copies sold per issue. The huge success and demand for Batman convinced DC Comics to turn the Brave and the Bold title into a Batman-centric comic, where Batman would team up with almost all the notable heroes of the DC Universe, except for Superman, with whom he still had all sorts of fantastic adventures in the world's finest comics. The popularity of the TV show allowed DC to get Batman back on the newspaper comic strips featuring the new look Batman, and on the surface level this looked like the greatest thing that could happen to Batman. But there were many downsides to this enormous success. The first of all being the fact that in the TV show Alfred was the most important supporting character for Batman and Robin. This created a demand for Alfred in the Batman comics, which created a problem, because Alfred was dead. Julius Schwartz experimented with ideas of how to bring back Alfred, and one of these ideas was published in Detective Comics number 347, where writer Garner Fox creates a very metafictional imaginary story, where Batman dies and he is replaced by the Batman of Earth 2, the Batman of the Golden Age, who also brings the Alfred of that universe. The story proved to be a massive success, and DC Comics realized that readers really wanted Alfred back. Schwartz saw an opportunity to bring back Alfred using the storyline of the Outsider, whose real identity had not been revealed. In the fall of 1966, almost two years after The Outsider was first introduced, Alfred was brought back to life as The Outsider. Detective Comics number 356 explains how Alfred apparently survived his fatal accident thanks to a scientist, but in the process he became the evil outsider, bent on destroying Batman and Robin. The story was met with mixed reactions. On the one hand, everyone was happy that Alfred was back, but on the other hand, longtime Batman readers who became invested in the saga of the outsider felt robbed. The Batman TV show not only ruined the outsider, but also created an increased demand for costume criminals. All throughout 1966 and 1967, DC Comics introduced a plethora of colorful villains, including Deathman, Spellbinder, the Monarch of Menace, the Hooded Hangman, the Eraser, the Clue Master, Poison Ivy, the Joker sidekick called Gaggy, and even the Flash villain called the Weather Wizard. Though Batman remained the best-selling comic during this time, the popularity of the TV show declined by the end of the second season in 1967. The producers needed something new and fresh for the third season, and they consulted with Julius Schwartz about the possibility of creating Batgirl, a new character to capture the untapped female audiences. They suggested Batgirl as the daughter of Commissioner Gordon, and using that concept, Schwartz and his team introduced Barbara Gordon as the new and improved Batgirl. Batgirl was quickly adapted into the third season of the Batman TV show, which saw a considerable decline in production quality as well as ratings. The audiences had grown tired of the series, and the network cancelled the show in 1968. This turn of events caused the biggest problem for the Batman comics, when sales plummeted and crashed down to the same levels as they were in 1964, and they continued to decline over the following months after the show ended. 
During the peak of the show's popularity, DC Comics' policy was that the Batman comics should follow the exact same formula of the show, with camp humor, lots of bad gadgets, sound effects, and dozens of costume criminals. One of the advantages of the show's popularity was that Catwoman was able to return to the comics after 13 years of absence, with a brand new design similar to the one of the TV show. DC Comics started bending the rules of the Comics Code Authority, and Batman's most seductive villain was finally brought back. Having the comics following the style of the series was a very effective marketing strategy, but once the show was cancelled, it created a disaster for the comics, because DC kept creating stories with the same absurd tone of the series, while only the most faithful Batman readers continued buying the books, and they had had enough of the camp. The letter pages of those comics are filled with fans complaining about the camp portrayal of Batman from the TV show, which remained in the comics even after the show ended. To make matters worse, Bill Finger had stopped working for DC Comics in 1967, with his last Batman story being written for the two-part episodes of the show featuring the Clock King, and his final comic featuring Batman being World's Finest Comics number 165. By 1968, the main creative team of the New Look Batman were also on their way out. Writers Garner Fox and John Broom moved away from Batman, while artist Carmine Infantino was promoted to editorial director at DC Comics. Editor Julius Schwartz was all alone, and he had one big problem. He needed to fix Batman, all over again. The first step to fix Batman in 1968 was the termination of Bob Kane's contract. At this point, Kane had been paying several of his ghost artists to create the new Batman stories on his behalf, and the readers started to notice how drastically different his style was from his own art only four years prior. Some readers even started to suspect that this was in fact not the same artist. And they were right. DC Comics decided that it was time to let Bob Kane go, and finally allow their own in-house artists to get the proper credit they deserved. Julius Schwartz brought in two new artists, Bob Brown for Detective Comics and Irv Novik for Batman. He also hired Frank Robbins as the new Batman writer, and with this new creative team, Schwartz tried to recapture the success of the new look Batman. Only this time, that wasn't going to be good enough. Schwartz and his team tried really hard to make Batman appealing, but they just couldn't do it. The art did improve after Bob Kane's departure, but the character design of Batman had become too closely associated with the campy version of the character. The stories were also not serious enough, and with each passing month, Batman got closer to being cancelled once again. Schwartz and his team tried everything to revitalize the Batman comics, and they started by creating slightly darker stories. Then they used classic Batman villains like the Joker and Catwoman, redesigning her outfit to avoid any similarities with the TV show, and even created solo Batgirl stories. But despite all these efforts, the stories in the main Batman comics were considered inferior, and simply not good enough, as the Batman stories from The Brave and the Bold. In 1968, a very young Neil Adams had tried multiple times to become the artist in the main Batman comics, but Julius Schwartz never gave him the opportunity. So Neil Adams went to the editor of The Brave and the Bold, telling him that he knew how to draw Batman better than anyone else. Neil Adams was given a chance to prove it, and in the fall of 1968, he illustrated Batman in issue number 79 of The Brave and the Bold. The story was a huge success among readers, who realized that this was precisely how Batman should look like. Neil Adams had been inspired by the Batman of the Golden Age, and thanks to his incredible artistic skills, he created what many considered to be the definitive Batman of all time. Adams became the main artist in the Brave and the Bold comics, and word about the greatest Batman in comics soon reached Julius Schwartz, who was not happy that his Batman was considered to be inferior to the Batman of the Brave and the Bold. In 1969, Schwartz finally hired Neil Adams to create a couple of covers for Detective Comics. In each of these issues, Schwartz and his team created darker stories in order to test the reader's reaction, and much to his surprise, the stories were successful. Finally realizing what needed to change, Schwartz and his team set in motion the biggest and last important change in the Silver Age of Batman. Schwartz had noticed that part of Batman's success in the Brave and the Bold stories was that he was mainly a solo act, with Robin always conveniently missing from those stories to make room for the superhero team-up. 
in Detective Comics number 393 and only a couple of months away from 1970, Short and his team started the storyline that would put an end to the partnership of Batman and Robin. The story culminated in the iconic Batman number 217, the last Batman story of 1969, where Dick Grayson leaves Gotham City in order to go to college, and Bruce Wayne decides to leave the Batcave and Wayne Manor. Schwartz was convinced that Wayne Manor and the Batcave had become too closely associated with the camp and comedy of the TV show, and they were seen as outdated relics from the past. Schwartz wanted to give Batman a breath of fresh air, moving his base of operations to the middle of Gotham, at the penthouse of the Wayne Foundation building, which had been renamed after Alfred's return. There was no other change that had been so significant in the Batman history until that moment, and from that point onwards, Batman had nowhere else to look but upwards. In roughly 15 years of history, Batman went through his most complicated era, a time filled with bizarre versions of the character, most of which didn't work and yet Batman endured during all those changes, showing just how easily Batman can adapt to the most extreme situations, because there isn't any other character out there who could have survived the downfall of Batman in the Silver Age of Comics. The history of Batman continues in the Bronze Age, the most exciting time period for the character, and trust me when I tell you that you don't want to miss that video. I love talking about the history of Batman, but these videos take a long time to make, so if you want to show some support, consider becoming a channel member, or take a look at my Patreon and be part of this awesome group of people, who I am forever grateful for. As always, thank you so much for watching this video, and I will see you in the next one.